Is that typical Bellingham uh, sort of weather? Yeah. Well, it's good to see you all. My name is Mike, if you don't know me. And uh, today we're talking about study as part of the rule of life. And uh, Gordon's asked to just take about a few, a minute or two to, yeah, just to speak. Cheryl and I subscribe to the Linden Tribune, which is a weekly newspaper. We grew up in Linden, so we get it. This past issue, there's an article about our own Dan Sanders. A picture of Sanford. Sanford, sorry, Dan Sanford. Forgive me, Dan. Anyway, he's got his picture and a little article about his hobby with watercolors. So I wanted just to show that. I'm going to pass it around. It's okay. Dan, that's it. Local Linden Tribune. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, the, welcome to the people on Zoom as well. Yeah. Sorry, I'm going to be a little distracted trying to get make the Zoom work all together. Uh, so before we dive into study this morning, uh, why don't you open your handout on page, I think it's three of the handout. There is a prayer of illumination right at the bottom of the page. And uh, I thought we could just read this together, read it as a class. It's written by Walter Brueggemann, who's, an, who's a theologian. But just as a prayer as we begin. So if you'll follow me, we'll read it kind of slowly and thoughtfully. Again, it's on the bottom of this page of prayers, prayer of illumination. <clears throat> Truth telling wind blowing life giving spirit we present ourselves now for our instruction and guidance read your truth among us read your truth of deep pride in us your truth of awesome sunday joy read your spirit of death and life that our story may be submitted to your will for life. We pray in the name of Jesus, risen to new life, and him crucified. Good, and I uh, wanted to read one of my favorite passages that often, as uh, we heard last week about prayer, right? But this psalm that I'm going to read often works its way into prayers and, and my prayers specifically, but uh, listen to how this describes the word of God, right? And see if your experience measures up, you know, if, it, if you have a similar experience of God's word, right? So here's the psalmist in Psalm 19, speaking of God's word. He says, the law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. Right? The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. Then we love this next part, don't we? More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the drippings of the honeycomb. Now I read that, uh, you know, and honestly, it convicts me. I don't often have that experience when I'm looking into God's word. But I think this psalm invites us into that experience, that the experience of God's word can be a transformational experience. It can be a renewing experience. It can be an enlightening experience, an opening of our mind to all God has for us. Now, 
when I was uh, I was once examined on the floor of presbytery for my ordination, and uh, I was examined on scripture. And you know, maybe it won't be surprising, but almost every question I was asked about scripture was, "What do you know? You know can you outline the book of Genesis? Can you name three judges?" Uh, do you know what the five books of Psalms are? Do you know the seven churches of Revelation? Can you outline the Gospel of John? And boy, they were after me. It was some, it was hard going. And and you know that's all right. That's the place for that to be done, right? Uh, but what I noticed looking back on it is none of them asked me, "How has your life changed because you were dwelling in the truths of God's Word?" <laughs> Well, you know, that would have stunned me. Then I would have really been shocked. I wouldn't have known how to answer. Uh, but that's the kind of experience God's word invites us into. Yeah. So that's the kind of experience we're seeking as we craft a rule of life. All right. Just a couple of things. Uh, I wanted to mention, you, you know, Gordon brought up last week the ideas of structure and intentionality, right? That this, uh, this, what we're doing here can, can sometimes be misunderstood like a rule. So we're putting ourselves in a place of a rule, right? But this is not, uh, this is not that kind of rule. Actually, the kind of rule this is, is like we call a ruler. It was used to draw uh, geometric figures. And so this rule is a rule to help us come to a certain shape in our lives, a certain form in our lives. It's to help us. And I love that I want to hearken back to something Greg said in the first week. You remember his uh, garden metaphor? Do you remember that? Somebody want to summarize that for us so that I'm not doing all the talking? We talked about weeds in the garden. Yeah. Go ahead, Julie. You've got it, don't you? Yeah. You have to cultivate those things that you cultivate and grow and things that you like pull out are left in the life. So to cultivate the things that pull out that seed. Yeah. And notice that there's an element of desire here. Like if you think of rule as terms of law, something you have to sort of shoulder up. I think we really miss the spirit of this, but there's something I want in my life and it's to be more like Christ. And so what I do is pull up and get rid of those things that aren't helping me along that path, right? And then I nurture, sort of build up more soil and fertilize those things that I think will really take me further down that road. All right. Now, we're going to just use this handout. I think it's really good. It points out some great things. So I want to invite you to just get the handout. We're going to take about five minutes to read it. And I'm going to ask for volunteers, uh, one paragraph each. So if someone would be willing to start with paragraph one in front of the handout. Yes, Cheryl, go ahead. An underlying feature of the culture of authenticity in which we live is self-determined individualism. The idea that we are whoever we choose to be independent of others. In an individualistic culture, we generally treat wisdom imposed on us from any outside source, be it from society in general, a previous generation, or a religious or a political authority with suspicion. <clears throat> to be authentic to ourselves, we are told we must have the freedom and ability to create our own identity and sense of self from scratch. Yeah, that's a really important paragraph. We'll hopefully come back to it. Who will read the second paragraph for us? Yes. Go ahead. Our contrast, the writer of Hebrews tells us that we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses who have preceded us and who say have something to teach us. Hebrews 12, 1. When the earliest Christians gathered together for the first time, they devoted themselves to the teaching of the apostles, 2.42. The early Christians help us see that our Christian identity is received rather than invented. This is quite a different story than the story of self-determined individualism. Okay, so in the first two paragraphs, there's a contrast 
between what we are today in our culture, our worldview, and what the biblical worldview is. I think that's very that's extremely applicable for us as Americans. We are the epitome of self-determined individualists. We are. And scripture calls us to a different way of forming our identity. Let's read uh, paragraph three. Who will do that for us? Go ahead, Gordon. We still need to translate ancient wisdom into our modern lives. This difficult work of translation requires humility to avoid the C.S. Lewis label as chronological snobby. <laughs> the uncritical acceptance of our modern age and the assumption that ancient wisdom has nothing to say to our current life situation is because it is out of date. Humility lies at the center of Benedict's rule. Benedict believed that humility, rather than ambition or self-determinism, should be our guide as we navigate our spiritual lives. One of the marks of humility, according to Benedict, is the willingness to allow us others to speak into our lives. When we commit ourselves to study, this is precisely what we do. We allow for others to shape our minds and hearts. It's that's a beautiful paragraph. <clears throat> Humility. I don't think my presbytery examiners, I'm sure they were interested in my humility. They just weren't considering it in my in their examination of me, right? That wasn't something they were looking at. Okay, the next paragraph, who will read that for us? Yes, go ahead. In his letter to the Christians in Rome, Paul spoke, speaks of being transformed by renewing our minds. So that we will all know how to discern prayer and how to God is active in the world. Romans 12, 2. The assumption is that when we identify where and how God is working, we will join God in this renewal of all things. In the same way, this prayer wakes us up to the presence of God in the world and in our lives. Study makes us attentive to God's transformational presence. How do we renew our minds? When we think about study, many of us think about the process by which we become smarter or figure out the right answer. But this is only one dimension of study. Benedictine study takes the form of lectio or sacred reading, which is prayerful, reflective reading rather than an academic reading. Lecto seeks to hear God's word for us and to us in our own context. It helps us to carefully ponder the wisdom of the religious scripture and to consider how it might change us and the world we inhabit. Lecto does not only think of a suitable for reading scriptures, it's also a helpful way to read Christian classics of contemporary worship based on. Good. Thank you, Barbara. Uh, let's go ahead and read the Creating a Rule of Life, and then we'll have a break for some discussion. So one more person, please, to read that next paragraph. Tom, go ahead, of course. You can incorporate study into your own rule in many ways. You may already be involved in a Bible study or a study scripture on your own. You may enjoy reading Christian or classic Christian texts or listening to contemporary Christian voices. Consider using a mixture of these practices. If you discover you only read scripture by yourself, look for a group to join. Scripture was meant to be read with others. If you tend to read contemporary Christian authors and neglect scripture or classic texts, expand your horizon. In all of this, the goal is the same, not to become smarter, though you may find you develop practical wisdom, but to be more attentive to God's presence in the world so that you may join God in the renewal of all things. Thanks, Tom. So that's pointing out something that's really uh, hits me is it's calling us to a communal reading of God's word. And I've realized now for several years that about 98% of my reading of the Bible is individual. And uh, in the early church, it would have all been communal. They would have gathered to hear the word of God read corporately. So such a, such a different approach and experience. And surely I can 
benefit if I can find ways to read the word of God corporately with other believers. Now, we've read this. I think it's it's really it really lays or sets the table, I guess, for what we're talking about today. But I want to just do a little, fun, hopefully a fun exercise. And uh, it's a case study. So you can put your handouts down. And the case study is about two seminary students, two students in a theological seminary. Now, it's probably not the experience of most here to have gone to a theological seminary, but you can imagine it's the study of theology and biblical studies and so forth. So student A and student B, and uh, at the end, I'll ask you questions or a question about these students. So seminary student A is very intelligent. He writes brilliantly. He reads voraciously, I should say he or she. Uh, he or she becomes the academic assistant to a very prominent systematic theology professor, like a well-published systematic theology professor, and uh, this person flies through seminary with a 4.0, perfect straight A average. It's like Tom. I don't know Tom is straight. And uh, because this person is so smart, they're tapped for PhD studies uh, to carry on the professorial role. Now, I've not told you everything about that seminary student, but I've told you the, the broad lines, okay? Now, here's seminary student B. Intelligent enough. Works hard on assignments. During his seminary life, he, he or she seeks out a mentor or perhaps a spiritual director. <clears throat> this person regularly attends a student prayer cell where students pray for one another and confess their sins to one another. And to gain ministry experience, this student volunteers as a hospice chaplain. Okay, so you have student A and student B. I've not told you everything, but I've told you the broad lines. Now, here's your question, just for our conversation, assuming both of these students continue in these life patterns. What might we expect from the ministry outcomes of each? In other words, what will be the fruit of their ministry life? What do you think? Give me what you think. Student A, student B. Yes. Well, I, I think student A will become a professor at a theological seminary. Mm -hmm. And and uh, will will impart uh, all, all that he or she has um, assimilated in to to a group that uh, become very enlightened and, and and great church leaders because of their mentorship by this professor. Okay, you can have a very productive role as a professor. Other other thoughts, either on student A or student B. Yes, Gord. I think student A will touch minds, student B will touch hearts. Mm -hmm. Okay. Good comparison. I think student B will have some real experiential experience <laughs> um, to really understand how the truth is played out in, in real life, in real situations, um, and probably perhaps be a little bit more deeply touched with what the truth actually means. Good. Thank you, Cheryl. Yes, Barbara. It's like student A has the potential for losing touch with the people and surrounding. Student B has the potential for tremendous romance. Mm -hmm. Tremendous. <laughs> that's a good point. So, <laughs> that's right. That's right. There needs to be a mutuality, doesn't it? That's, you know, I had not thought about that in terms of student B, but you're exactly right. It could happen. Other other comments or thoughts? Yes. That's what Barbara said makes me think of motivation. And I think um, it's really easy to lose motivation when you're trying to do something of either becoming, you know, the best, say, scholar or the best 
um, you know, doer, lay person, giver. Uh, and it's not about self direction on either scale. Mm -hmm. okay. Good. Thank you. Very insightful. Yeah, I thought this, I thought this exercise might help us, right? Because uh, we, are, and I'll speak for myself mostly, I'm very used to study for accomplishment, right? And when you enter a study program in our world, what do you get if you do well? You get good grades, you get a degree, get standing if you're you might actually get a good job it's all for a certain amount of accomplishment right mm -hmm. student b what i was trying to portray is he saw his learning not in isolation in other words it wasn't isolated to his mind and what information he could process it also included his body and his relationships emotionally, and Cheryl hit on it. I think he was, he uh, will be a, he will be empathetic to other people's needs. So he's not neglecting the information. The mental is there, but the emotional, the volitional, is also present. So I think this rule of life is calling us to that kind of learning. So remember, I mentioned isolation. So he's, he isolates his mind but he also isolates his person, right? So he's not going to Jeff and saying, hey, Jeff, you know, uh, you're a little bit more experienced than me in life. Maybe we should have lunch and I'd like to hear what you have to say. And I wanna share some situations I'm facing with you and maybe you can give me some input how you might handle that, right? That's, a, that's more of a relational approach to learning. It's not an isolated approach. So I think in our day, we tend toward this self-determined individualism, and we tend toward learning for the sake of accomplishment and ambition. This rule of life is calling us to quite a different kind of learning, a learning that's not isolated to the mind, includes the will, the emotions, the body, and a learning that's not isolated to the individual, but includes the body of Christ in that word. Makes sense? Yeah, comments, Lynn? Uh, maybe you think of going to a medical doctor that is very knowledgeable and very, you know, with this, where would you rather talk to someone like that or someone that is more relational based? And tell me more about, tell me more about this rather than you know, here's what I need. Mean. <laughs> I keep studying. Uh, coming back. Really, yeah. Good. 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 Yeah. Well, we talked back to Benedict saying about um, the case of humility. Because that to be able to seek other people's input, to be able to pray with others. To Share your sins with others. I mean, that takes that humility. Yeah, I just want to just kind of drive that home a little bit. I don't think we Westerners and Presbyterians, especially, we're not used to the word vulnerability, right? Mm -hmm. like we don't like our weakness to show. But I, um, I want to say there's almost no spiritual growth without it. If I can't say to a brother in Christ, hey, I'm struggling with this. This is getting me. This is tripping me up. Would you pray for me and ask me how I'm doing? Then honestly, I think I'm just going to keep being tripped up. And, you know, that's how addictions form, right? That's how it happens. So almost no spiritual growth without vulnerability and humility is the key to vulnerability. Yes. For some reason, I don't understand. We've been thinking lately a lot about the difference between knowledge and wisdom. And interestingly, scripture was in the list of spiritual gifts. Both are listed separately. Mm -hmm. 
And I uh, reminded when I lived in Washington, D.C., I spent a lot of time in the life of Congress and the great hall. There are these models engraved above some of the doors. And one that just has stuck with me forever is Molly Thomas, but we've been neighbors. Oh. <laughs> I love that. Don't ask me to explain it, <laughs> but it's really touched me. I don't see that we need to choose. But the way you frame these two students, it sounds like student A is at the knowledge of student B has wisdom, but I don't know why we can't have both. I would like to take the final team taught by both of these. <laughs> <laughs> It's a good point. And I, my, I'm hoping student B, he's not neglecting his the informational side of his learning, but very good point that these balance one another. And I love that quote, knowledge comes, but wisdom lingers. Yeah, it reminds me of the Proverbs, you know, that wisdom is something if you seek for it as a hidden jewel or hidden treasure, you will find it. But there's obviously a long process of digging that out. Thank you. Very good. All right. Let me just, uh, uh, on our sheet here, there are some discussion questions. And I've, you know, taken the liberty to just adjust those a little bit. But uh, let's do the first one in uh, as a large group. And then we'll split up into small groups. And I'm going to, uh, yeah. So the first one is, was there anything surprising here that you read or anything that you think, well, they really should talk about this and they didn't in spiritual reading or Lexio, um, that's usually called Lexio Divina, which just means spiritual or godly reading or study. So anything surprising, anything left out? Well, I think there was something missing. Yeah. Um, yeah. They talk on this handout I just read the first time about scripture uh -huh. and maybe Christian classics. Yes. But I think any study that we do, even if it's a secular book, we can approach it with this attitude. Lord, what I study today, whether it's in scripture or whether it's in this Christian classic or whether it's in this other piece of literature, help me in this study to know you better, to know your creation better, to know myself better. So no matter what we study, it can be a communion with God. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to be just scripture or a Christian classic. But yes. in fact, I, I wrote the metal we go to read anything. Right. The things we ought not to do. But generally, anything we study, we can have a we can communion with God through it, and He can keep us thinking about Himself and His work and Bible. Beautiful, beautifully said, Gordon. The idea that all truth is God's truth. We don't put life into sectors. This is my work life. This is my God life. It's all his. Mm -hmm. uh, how about movies? Do we learn from movies? Provided we go into it, I think, with this idea, look, I'm, Lord, I need to discern what you're saying in this art form. Or when, when we listen to a, a music, for example play sports. I think all of these are learning opportunities if we, if they're all under his um, sovereignty and leadership. Any other things missing or things that surprised you from this reading? All right, well, let's, uh, let's get into groups of three. Now we're asking, uh, you know, don't be in your spouse, don't be with your spouse, get in a different group. And let's try to keep the groups to three. If uh, if the numbers don't work out just right and there's one group of four, we'll accept it. But let's get into groups of three. And, and your questions are written right here. They're similar to what's in the paper, not very different. But share your current reading practice. And what I'd like you to share is what you read, when you read, and how you read. What, when, and how. Maybe I should write that up there. And by when, like Gordon, yes, last week he said he does his uh, prayers in the morning. When, when do you do yours? And then how, meaning do you take notes? Do you outline? Do you just read it uh, somewhat passively? How do you read? So I'm going to say what, when, and how. It's been not very good. And the second one is just to share an experience of renewal that led to your own transformation. If you have that, it comes to mind. 
can share it with your group. Now, this one, I'm going to say, take the, do this very quickly. What you read, uh, when and how you read. This shouldn't take more than a minute per person. Okay. This one may take a little bit longer. Take three or four minutes on that. Okay. So just so all three people have some time to share. Okay. Go ahead and get your groups. I need a little I think I'm going to break you guys up. Tom, so let's talk about that. Thanks. Thank you. And uh, Zoom, Zoomers. Feel free to have your own conversation. Hi, Phyllis. Hi, Curry. It's good it's to see you hard. all. It's kind so, of hard uh, because uh, we, we get we get the audio from you guys. It kind of draws us draws, draws us out. Okay, I'll mute. I'll mute myself here, and hopefully remember to unmute myself when we come back together. Because yeah, I can't unmute you. You will need to do it when when you. Well, oh, there's there's Marilyn and Dick too. Hi, good to see you. Okay, I'm going to mute so you guys can hopefully have your own conversation. Okay. All right. Thank you. Good deal. Do you, how about uh, the two McLeods there? You want to un unmute yourself? Or is, there, is there only one McLeod? <laughs> I don't know. Only one right now. Okay. Um, yeah. Sorry, I forgot I was on mute. Well, I, we do that to get to keep the, uh, the the thing sort of reasonable here. Um, yeah, I know it makes total sense. Yeah. Um, well, I guess here um, the. Um, First question about the reading. I try to do it um, in the morning. And then if I don't do it in the morning, because it's not that I have like the ultimate discipline to have it every single day um, at that time, then I try to slip it in later. And that isn't great. <laughs> you know, it doesn't work as well as having it every single day at the same time. And um, so I, I try to do um, whatever, like the early birds are usually doing a study. And so I oftentimes, um, you know, use that some of that time for that study. And then I try to pick out books I've heard of or um, something I'm looking to learn more about for my own personal books that I might be reading. But I usually find that I get the most out of reading scripture itself. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so I like to have both things available, but when, the second question about transformation, um, I think that's most uh, not like transformation of your entire life, but transformation of your day or how it's going. Um, I find that happens when I read scripture, not typically other books that have been written about it. Um, that's just my experience that okay. the word of God is what changes your heart and your attitude more than some author. So. Okay. What about either of, of the Ellis's in San Antonio? Are you, do you want to comment? Can you hear us? Yes. We can oh. hear you. Oh, thank you. Hey, good to see you. Oh, we love to read. Uh, it's one of the great joys of our lives. Um, I would say, that, uh, and we read scripture every morning. Uh, you know, a bit of so, but um, mostly we love to read history and biography. 
and uh, we learn from um, men and women, uh, and many often that may lead us to feel closer to, to Christ. What would you say, honey? Yes, I don't disagree with what you're saying, but I, good morning. Um, I also thought it was a really good, uh, what was expressed just at the la in the last interview, <laughs> um, that it transforms your day. Um, although we don't spend maybe more than 15, 20 minutes each morning uh, in our uh, uh, studying together, uh, it does change and we learn from it. It uh, is always enriching and it does change what we are doing each day rather than having it just um, the, grund, uh, the grind of uh, solving this uh, household problem or that household problem uh, and being the focus of life. So the focus is different when we study and uh, on the day or two that we might miss it, um, it makes a difference. You know, thank you. I, I mean, I may just, <clears throat> just comment that when you said transformation, I guess I was thinking in grand terms, like my major transformation was when I discovered that Christianity was, was Jesus and not just a, 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 a interesting body of ideas and, and the Bible and, and things like that, that it was a person. But, but that's sort of a grand transformation, a wholehearted, total transformation of my thinking and everything. And I think he he's also must be referring to s small minor transformations in how you view things or something like that. Is that what you all feel? Yeah, I, that's how I feel. Dick, what about Yeah, you? I agree. Yeah. Okay. How about the rest of you? <laughs> Anybody else want to comment? No, I, I think you're right. We I think all of us naturally have times where we have you might say giant leaps in our understanding who who uh, Jesus is, who he calls us to be, and, and where we are in our commitment. Uh, and uh, then in between those times is what uh, really, uh, I guess, becomes even more important uh, after we've made those initial confessions and awareness of who God is in our life. Uh, but I, I kind of wrote down, uh, it's just where I am with my health issues and my age and my uh, life experiences, but I'm, I'm spiritually hungry. So uh, all sources of, uh, I see as spiritual growth, certainly primarily is, is uh, uh, scripture itself and, and the, the preached word and uh, those special opportunities, but uh, in all ways, we can look, as uh, Mike was suggesting, in, even in television or general reading or whatever it might be, what is God saying in, in that person's uh, words or actions or uh, circumstances and how we feel that we might have acted differently than what we've seen or read. Uh, so everything, uh, anything that would help give the mind and heart of God uh, into our understandings is, is, is game for me. Uh, but I do the regular scripture study and meditation and prayer generally in the mornings. But through the day, like all of us, I think we, we are seeking and we're hungry and we uh, want to see what God says about this subject or that or these special words or anything that leads to our transformation. Are you ready to come back, Mike? It looks like you might be ready. Okay. Yeah. Welcome back, Zoomers. We're going to uh, come back from our groups now. Okay. <clears throat> Seemed that everybody enjoyed that. I think we should just have a small group, just come to church an hour early and have a small group, just do that. Yeah. Smell a little bit, let's see. All right, um, 
I want us just to look again at the handout on this section that talks about Lexio Divina. So it's on the very back page, the very back page. Lexio Divina is a, an approach to reading scripture, not so much a method, but an approach that's been helpful all through the history of the church. It was used in monasteries. It was developed by Benedict himself. And many people have found it helpful. I think uh, Protestant and Reformed Christians have uh, added certain elements to it that I think are useful. But let's let's just read this approach. Who would like to read the first part? Well, this is the first two parts of Lexio Divina, first two numbers. Anyone? <clears throat> Go ahead, Cheryl. You got it. Verse two. Read the text through for basic comprehension. What does the text say? Sometimes it can be helpful to use a commentary to fill out the context, but it is not always necessary. Number two, think deeply or meditate on the passage. Circle or write down a word or phrase that jumps out to you. Think about what God might reveal to you about himself or about your life through the passage. Okay, so you see, it's just an approach to reading scripture there. Let's go ahead and read points three and four. Who's going to read that for me? Pray Thank you. Pray to God's spirit to help you understand what you have read and to give you what you need to respond obediently. After meditating on the passage, you may feel like thanking God for a gift you have received, crying to God because of some injustice you see, or asking God for courage or compassion. Ask, number four, ask. Our prayerful reading of scripture is not complete without the event of our participation in what God has called us to do. As James reminds us, we are to be doers of the word, not merely hearers, James 1. Let me ask, how many of you have consciously practiced Lexio Divina, this kind of approach to scripture? Have you? Yeah, quite a quite a number, quite a number. Um, are there things here, perhaps things you heard in your group or things that you've done, which you think, well, we really should give attention to this, that that these four little, you know, obviously brief paragraphs do not mention anything left out here that you'd like to bring up? Yes. It's harder yeah. than it's for me, and just think about um, trying to memorize something. Right. To help. Think deeper into. Um, yeah. Yeah, good. Thank you. Can I share? Uh, well, anyone else first? I don't want to just jump in. I'd like to hear what you have to share. Can I share that when, uh, when it says, you know, Circle something that jumps out at you. Circle or write down a word or phrase that jumps out to you. But I have a little bit of a, ooh, a reaction to that because I think, well, what jumps out to me may be exactly what I'm sort of pre-programmed to hear. And what I need to pay attention to is what confuses me, what doesn't jump out at me, what, uh, what I say, man, I really don't understand that. And... Uh, and there are, there are some passages of scripture. I just read one this morning in Leviticus. It's talking about how the ancient people dealt with leprosy. <laughs> and I'm like, wow, you know, what jumps out at you there? What jumps out at me is this is really an ancient text that had a very ancient way of dealing with skin diseases and uh, communicable diseases. <clears throat> And uh, I'm not sure I can take a lot of warm fuzzies from it. Put them outside the town. Yeah, exactly. Isolate them, put them outside the town they, to cover their upper lip and say, unclean, unclean, right? So that they don't communicate that disease to anyone else. Well, I do know because I have, because kind of hear this, because I read the Bible in the community of the church, right? I know that leprosy through the scripture becomes symbolic 
of moral guilt and human sin. And so I'm reading this, not for what jumps out at me or what grabs me or what word or phrase grabs me, but I'm reading this as an ancient people who, uh, for whom Christ became the purification, right? The healing balm became Christ. Do you see what I'm saying? Yes. Um, a little bit unrelated, but in the same sense of ancient tribal type of thinking, uh, why did people worship the gods of Baal? They were like for everything specific thing that you run to. And it's just, again, slightly addictive and dependent. And, uh, you know, just something to think about. Yeah. Well, and the good point is, if you're only using, using this approach to scripture, you might only read from John or Philippians or <laughs> Romans, right? Passages that you know speak to you. You might not get around to the whole of scripture. So I'm wondering if in your groups, did anyone share how they read the whole Bible? Did anyone talk about that? Didn't have that in your groups? Does anyone have a practice of, you did you? Can you share with us? Yeah. Good. Right. And they make it through the Bible in a certain period of time. Yeah. Yeah, that's been my practice for years, is to read half of the Old Testament and all of the New Testament every year, so that every two years I complete the Old, and every year I complete the New. I just find it a little bit onerous to read the Old Testament all the way through every year. Yes, Dan? You know, recently, in the last couple of years, I've been fascinated by the nature of our use of words, our language, and kind of the shadowy um, meaning to, to certain particularly abstract words that uh, either is somewhat more positive or brings a picture into our mind. So uh, what I'm driving at is that various versions of the Bible are worth looking at. Here it mentions commentary. Yeah. But what about different versions? Because many of those were developed over quite a bit of time of thought and meditation by the people who did those interpret those translations. Yeah. And uh, it's really, I think, uh, evidence of how God is trying to sharpen the pencil of your understanding by looking at the way different people have chosen particular words in the scripture and seeing what they take two or three different types of words for the same passage and then you're getting really a good idea of what that intent was. Very, very helpful, Dan. Yeah, I, I just want to add to that too that you know, they bring out here the importance of communal or corporate reading of scripture. And uh, almost every branch of knowledge, I think every branch of knowledge is communal, right? If you study education in the local college, you're going to be reading educational specialists, right? So what people have discovered over generations. And I think if we, if we hyper-individualize our reading of scripture, like what is God saying to me today? We really miss something. We need to know what God said to the church through the ages in that scripture. And that's hard. That requires some mental, uh, you know, some, some acumen. It requires some concentration. Yeah. There was a comment here first, and then we'll finish. Anglo-Saxon kind of thinking about the Bible and that interpretation and how that kind of influenced our. America's um, since the beginning of time to the degree of, you know, condoning slavery, you know, writing a set of rules that is based on that culture. And uh, it's just something to really grapple with as well. I can understand. Yeah. Well said. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, sure. I was going to say two things. So, kind of going with what, what you said. Um, so, when I would read the Bible in China, I look at the notes to, you know, because I'm not a theologian and I don't know Greek or Hebrew. And so, I'd often look at the comments, um, the notes, you know, studying notes in the Bible. And I remember being so frustrated 
Um, and I can tell you one real specific time I was reading a, a chapter in Isaiah, and it was talking about idols and idol worship and temples. And at the bottom, it says, well, you know, we no longer have idols in the world that we worship. They mm -hmm. I didn't look out my window <laughs> and see to that Buddhist temples and, you know, people walking in circles. Who wrote this? <laughs> I just, I found it very frustrating and very uh, limiting, right? That, like you're saying, that it was kind of transformed into a anchor fashion. Will be in a sense and the usage, you know, that's favorable usage. Well, and just not making, you know, even if we don't live in that context right now, making us aware that there are still contexts like that in the world, right? It's where people do still live among idols, worship idols. Mm -hmm. um, and then the other thing is the fan said, um, I like to use a dictionary. I have a dictionary app on my phone, just like Webster's dictionary. And I find looking up you know, words that are really common to us mm -hmm. to see what do they really mean or what's the Latin root? You know, they can become you know, worshipful or what does worshipful really mean or what is righteous? I found that to be very enriching to me. Good. <clears throat> we're, uh, we're coming to an end of the class, but I, I want to just ask another question. And it's just occurred to me. I hope the Zoom people are hearing some of the conversation in class. Could you? You are good, Chuck. Thank you. Yeah, because uh, it would be a pity if you weren't. Um, I want to ask, how do we read the Bible corporately, right? In our day, how do we do that? Do some of you have experience doing that, reading corporately. Uh, would you share that? Should we be reading corporately, or is it just fine just to read in my bedroom by myself? At home? What do you think? Yes, Ken. Well, my my Karen and I always are 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 reading the Bible together. Uh, that is day after day. Uh, but I use a new resupply standard version, and she uses the NIV and the Message. Okay. And uh, that that gives us uh, some of the the permutations or, or interpretations, uh, understanding a little bit of, of uh, good the yeah. differences. Yeah. Thank you, Ken. Good practice reading as a couple. Uh, yes, I think you had to come. I've been affiliated with a group called Community Bible Study, which makes a workbook. Okay. And it's written by, it's a very global um, Bible study. So you might find you're in a group with people that are Catholic or non-believers even. Yes. And you get this completely sideways comment, maybe that you know you thought all along was going along with the Bible, but it's a really good question. And um, having that mix of people has really given me a new perspective. Good. I know a lot of ladies here do Bible study fellowship, right? Which is, it is a communal way of reading the Bible, studying the Bible together. Have you found that helpful? I'm just teeing you up. Tell us how it's been helpful to you. It's really, it's been really helpful. We have been in Bible study for many years. And um, it's taught me, um, you know, how to pray, how to, how to listen to the words and discover what, what, what in the world does that mean? Mm -hmm. How am I going to use that this year with Israel and my prophet? Those are very, those are probably one of the most challenging mm -hmm. uh, years. There's two different years where it's more challenging in a way. But uh, it's been very interesting in this, in this time in our world. Yeah. To read the about yeah, so corporate Bible study can be very challenging uh, and very helpful. I think also, uh, have any of you been associated with the Anglican Church or read through the Book of Common Prayer? Have you ever followed that prayer practice? Bunch of Presbyterians. <laughs> Hurry my head. Well, it's it's an amazing tool developed by Cromwell and I don't know, you know, a few centuries ago in England, where they pray their prayers together. Their prayers are very well crafted.
crafted, very well written, very rich theologically and deep. So you're being taught as you pray. And then you're also reading scripture together and you're all constantly praying the Psalms. So it's a way that even if you're in, at home, you're reading through your prayer book and there are apps for this, of course, in this day. Uh, it's a beautiful way to pray together, to pray with others. Yeah. Any other examples of corporate prayer? Yes. I've always felt that the church didn't use the New Testament, the teaching of the law all of us. Yeah. I mean, I came through that with that system, and I just felt that we didn't, they didn't have a prayer level of a law. Think of it. So that sometimes you tell them that you, that you didn't do a really great job. I mean, you know, that you didn't follow the kind of church. That's interesting. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, do we do we teach people to pray? Uh, uh, Eugene Peterson, famous writer, he said his his call to the pastorate was to teach his people to pray. Hey, we're almost done. Uh, if there's a burning comment, I just want to give you a chance to say it before we go out. There's a burning comment. Go for it, sir. Getting back to the corporate Bible reading, I really appreciate when in the church you take the Bible out of your you know, human and we all open it together and you're looking at the scripture that's been taught in context, right? You, you know what else is in the Bible. Because not everyone who is coming to church nowadays has that background. And they hear a little portion of scripture, but they don't know the greater context or even where it maybe to find it. Yeah. We should have on our slides what page to find it. Mm -hmm. Good ideas, yeah, good ideas. Not as scary things old in this dialogue. Yeah, and yeah, and I think Cheryl, what you're saying is true. People in our day, like we read novels, we know a little bit about reading in our day, less than former days, but we certainly don't know about reading a book that was inspired over a 1500 year period, over 60 plus authors, you know, over various cultures. It's the Bible is a complex book. We need help to read it. Now, and Bible study fellowship when I taught the children. I always, you know, I had a story in the head. You know, but I always, we always were to open the scripture and tell them this is a true story written in God's word. Mm -hmm. You know, so they learned that. I was telling them the story, but it was here. Yeah. The and then it always passed, went, and it always took the Bible to each child and they just put their finger on the memory books that they remember. So, I mean, it's important to know. Yeah. From, I tell um, my kids, because their they're kid, my grandkids are always reading, you know, Chronicles of Narnia or Space Ventures or this or that, that the main thing that was read to me as a child it was a big Bible story book with amazing, engaging pictures. And I, I tell you, my hero as a boy growing up was David, who fought Goliath. I just thought, man, I want to be like that guy. You know, of course, I've realized through the years that there are other ways I need to grow. But, but still, uh, keeping scripture in front of our children, I think, is really important. Now, before we stop... Let me just give you just a moment. Let me ask this question. Have you heard anything today that you would like to incorporate into your way, your rule of life? Uh, anything from this Lexio Divina or any principles? Now, I'm not going to I'm not going to ask you to talk back to me about that, but we want this is the purpose of class, right? It's to craft a rule of life to, you know, pull up the things we don't want in our life, get rid of those and nurture the things that we do. So as we close today, just give that a moment. What have I heard today that I would like? Or maybe what have I not heard, but it's occurred to me? Maybe the Holy Spirit speaking to us. All right, you've been a wonderful class. And I want to close by reading this prayer of Augusta, uh, Thomas Aquinas, rather, not Augustine. 
so I'll, I'll read it. And if you will just enter into the spirit of prayer with me. Ineffable creator, you are proclaimed the true font of light and wisdom and the primal origin raised high beyond all things. Put forth a ray of your brightness into the darkened places of my mind. Disperse from my soul the twofold darkness into which I was born, sin and ignorance. You make eloquent the tongues of infants. Refine my speech and pour forth upon my lips the goodness of your blessing. Grant to me keenness of mind, capacity to remember, skill in learning, subtlety to interpret, and eloquence in speech. May you guide the beginning of my work, direct its progress, and bring it to completion. You who are true God and true man, who live and reign, world without end. Amen. Thank you. Next week, who do we have? Oh, yeah. Greg for oh, Greg for recreation. And then we have work. Yeah. Great. I've got it other week. Yeah. And then, and then hospitality. hospitality comes yeah. after that. We'll have a skip in it because we won't be doing it on the 30th of May or the 28th of May. Yeah. 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 Yeah.